which uh, let me extend a warm welcome to all of you, people who are physically present, and I'm sure people who are listening online. I think this is an important event in TFR academic calendar. As uh, Sanjay said, you know, we were born in on June 1st, 1945. I think Dr. Homi Baba did this with the generous help of uh, the Rabji Tata Trust, and that was aided by Bharat Ratna JRD Tata. And uh, it was in an IAC, the TFR was born, and then it moved later part of the 1945 to Bombay. And uh, the genesis of the foundation, like I said, took place much later, actually. This is during the centenary year celebration of Homi Baba in 2008. It was decided that uh, we must have a foundation day lecture by eminent person across various disciplines. And uh, we will have it uh, possibly every year. And the first lecture in 2009 was given by Dr. Kotkar, who was then uh, who was the former Atomic Energy Commission chairman and also the secretary of the Department of Atomic Energy. Then followed by late Professor Abdul Kalam, who was a former president. Then uh, Professor Govardhan Mehta. Then uh, Mr. Ranayana Murthy. And then uh, and, uh, it was uh, Romila Tapar, who was an eminent historian. Then uh, Dr. K. Radhakrishnan, former chair of the ISRO. And uh, I think then uh, Raghuram Rajan, who was a former uh, the chair, former governor of Reserve Bank of India. And then uh, in 2019, we had uh, Dr. K. Kasurangan, architect of the NEP, who gave a talk about the national education policy. So after two years, uh, now in 22, we are having a lecture from another eminent scientist, uh, Dr. Gandhi Kang. And um, I'm thankful to her for accepting our invitation. And uh, usually, of course, our foundation day is on June 1st, but due to different schedules, we always have these lectures, uh, try to have the lectures in June. And uh, I'm happy that he could, she could devote some time and come there. And uh, the talk is going to be an important topic, which is uh, extremely useful for us. And uh, like you, I'm also eagerly waiting to hear this. Thank you. Now tell us, tell us something more about the speaker. May I call upon Professor Kultur. He'll come over and tell us and take us through to the entire proceedings for the day. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, again, thanks everyone for being here. Um, of course, introducing Dr. Kang or Gagandeep or Charya, some of us call her, um, is not an easy task. She probably doesn't need any introduction because I think most of us um, have been aware or associated or known of her work and of her uh, views on public health uh, on multiple fora. Um, but still, uh, to do the formalities, I'll say a few things. Um, <clears throat> she trained in medicine and then <clears throat> in microbiology from CMC Bellor, uh, where I guess she's been associated for most of her career, except for a short stint here and there, but otherwise she's been mostly at CMC Bellor. Um, I mean, most of us who think about Gagandeep would immediately relate her to vaccine. And uh, in fact, there is this famous saying, um, I mean, at least I picked it up from Wikipedia. It says uh, she is described as India's vaccine godmother. And, um, uh, and the reason is because she is not only uh, led uh, a significant amount of work by her research, um, but also has emphasized on the importance of vaccine across. Um, her main focus area has been in the enteric diseases uh, and public health in India. Um, she has worked on many different things, um, including on viral infections, nutrition in young children, um, particularly with those from uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, and uh, she's also one of the authorities in India uh, in epidemiology, 
and public health. She's been awarded with many uh, prestigious awards. Uh, she's fellow of many academies, including uh, she's a of the fellow. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of uh, uh, fellow of Royal Society in the UK. Um, she is on many global committees and advisory panels, including on the WHO, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and even recently on CEPI, which is an innovative global partnership between public, private, and uh, philanthropic individuals. Um, essentially, to um, which was launched in Davos in 2017 to develop vaccines to top further further epidemics. Uh, she is also synonymous with um, voice of reason rationale and really putting facts on the table um, be it for research or for public policy and uh, who usually is one of the, uh, the tough voices you would like to have uh, no matter whether you're talking about administration or policy or research uh, somebody who really puts in critical uh, inputs and feedbacks and um, in the current days i think we need more people like her um, with that, I'll stop. Of course, we can go on and on about uh, all our achievements, um, but I'll stop here and I'll request Sherry to give her the talk. Thank you. Um, and you can ask questions during the talk as well. So we'll keep it as informal as possible. Thank you. So thank you to the TIFR community for inviting me to join you for your Foundation Day lecture. It is always a privilege to come and visit and to speak to so many of the incredible people that work here and study here. So I'm going to be talking to you today about what it takes to measure and manage infectious diseases in India. And to do that, I'm going to talk first about the importance of measurement in health and, in, and for vaccines, then talk about my favorite virus, and then my favorite bacterium, and then come to one that has been in the news and ask you questions. So to come to introduction to measurement in health and for vaccines, we all know this in science, without measurement, we are nothing. We have no understanding of what we need to do or how we evaluate the results of any experiments that we do. Now, when it comes to medicine and to public health, there are domains for measurement and these relate to the quality of healthcare. These have been laid out quite clearly by the Institute of Medicine, and we use these in application to public health as well. When we think about interventions in particular, we want to know, are they safe? Are they efficient? Is this the best use of our resources? Do they work? Are we giving them at the right time? Do they promote equity and do they actually provide the right kind of services to the people whom we serve? Now, when I talk about services, usually if we look at the way the government talks about delivery of interventions, they use a terminology that I have problems with. And that terminology is anybody who gets a service from the government is a beneficiary. So the government's mindset is currently that it is doing you a favor by delivering a service to you. 
And that, to a large extent, to me at least, explains the fact that we don't put the person at the center of the services that we deliver. That most of what is delivered in our country as healthcare is a top down process where policy has been decided without necessarily working our way through to whom it is actually going to impact. And that's why when we look at evaluation, we don't look at the benefit to the people we serve. We, our evaluations are about process. How many doses did we give? How many tests did we do? How many beds have we provided? Not about did the person get better? Did a person who was vaccinated not actually get ill or not? So measurement underpins everything that we do. Now in infectious diseases in particular, but in most of medicine, when you sit in a hospital, you actually don't see the entire picture of the disease that is out there in the population. And why is that? Because by the time you get to a hospital, you're actually quite sick. If we measure disease, we measure that illness, that which comes to a place where we can measure disease, a laboratory or a hospital, and then we measure deaths because we record vital events. So you're seeing only a part of the picture. Now, this is not true for all infectious diseases. Diseases like tetanus, rabies, and smallpox, these are diseases where if you have the illness, anybody who has the illness manifests with symptoms, and those symptoms are very, very recognizable without necessarily even needing a laboratory test. But most of infectious disease is like an iceberg. Much of what leads to that clinical illness, that leads to that death, is hidden below the surface of the healthcare system. Yet we know that if you want to look at impact, you need to monitor not only what is happening today, right now, but also monitor over time because you want to be able to see if you introduce an intervention, does it make a difference? So therefore, there is a global reference list of 100 indicators that WHO has classified as essential. It's not relevant really what they are. The important thing is consistency in measurement over time in order to understand what is happening to populations. Now, when it comes to thinking about vaccines, to make a decision for any healthcare intervention in a resource poor country, what do we need to do? We are going to use our money to deliver an intervention. It can be a drug, it can be a vaccine, it can be a treatment, it can be anything. But when you do one thing, it takes resources away from another. So how do you decide which one matters most. You do that by measurement. What is the burden of disease and how much of that disease can I alleviate if I bring in this intervention? So for vaccines, what do we do? We look at the disease, we look at how well the vaccines are working, and then we look at whether we can actually deliver them within the healthcare system that we have. To make these decisions, you need to understand what each of these are, the performance of the vaccine and how much disease there is. Now, if we look at burden and prioritization, it actually goes beyond just the burden of disease. If you also look at priorities, whom does it matter to? And to me, the most important measurement is is this an intervention that actually promotes equity? With vaccines, all of you understand the healthcare system in India. You and I 
can buy any intervention we want. We can get a bone marrow transplant. We can get the latest of the vaccines that are available in the global market because the private market and private supply provides us with that. We have the resource. But in a country where 70% of all expenditure on healthcare is out of pocket, these interventions are not for everyone. And especially when it comes to vaccines, which are a mode of prevention, the only way the poorest people in our country are going to get vaccines is if the government provides it to them. Therefore, for the government to understand what the burden of disease is, is really important. This is true not just for our government, it's true for governments around the world. And that's why WHO's triple billion target is about reaching more people, improving care, and improving protection, not just from pandemics. Because it is a fact of life that where you are born, which family you are born into, in any part of the world, will determine what your health, your education, and your economic prospects are. And preventive strategies and primary health care are one potential way of changing that. Now let's come to measurement in India, right? You recognize the names, polio, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis. Well, we have lots of ways of measuring them. Lots of programs that tell us that they are generating the data for all of these vaccine preventable diseases. Now, this is a comparison of diphtheria cases in India, where two separate groups undertook an investigation of diphtheria outbreaks in India. The official figure was 6,000, and that came from the figure that is on the right. And yet another government agency did another investigation, found diphtheria in more places and more cases in the places that had been identified by the other agency. So whose data do we trust? What is an official figure? And how do we decide when we have done a good job of control or not? So that's why mostly if you want to introduce a new vaccine into the Indian program, you have to do the measurements yourself. And this is what we did for rotavirus. Now, rotavirus uh, is a cause of dehydrating gastroenteritis in children. It's the number one killer when it comes to diarrheal diseases in very young children. Children are small, they have a big surface area. So if they have both diarrhea and vomiting, they get dehydrated very quickly and die. Now, rotavirus is uh, found all over the world. And if you want to look at measuring disease burden, what do you look at? Do you look at deaths? Do you look at hospitalizations? Do you look at outpatient visits? Do you look at disease that doesn't reach the healthcare facility? In addition to that, you could look at how many days people were sick. You could look at how much the disease cost for that family or for society. And then you could look at, is this different depending on time or what the strains were that were circulating in the community? So estimating disease burden requires lots of different kinds of measurement. So I'm not going to talk to you about what is in the black, but I will tell you about the work that we did to try and measure rotavirus infections in the community and in the hospital. So the first study I started with, I wasn't looking at measuring the burden of disease. I was looking at, can I identify a correlate of protection against rotavirus infection? And that required essentially a cohort design. So to be able to identify every rotavirus infection that a child had, 
and then see whether they were protected from severe disease or not. And the way that you do this is actually identify women when they are pregnant, wait till their babies are born, and then keep sampling their babies, even if they don't have diarrhea, to figure out whether they've gotten infected or not. And then, of course, when they get diarrhea or anyone else in the family has diarrhea, you sample them again. And then if you want to measure immune response, then you have to collect blood samples for that. And then you have to do a lot of characterization. Now, this turned out to be a very useful tool for us to be able to look at a number of things beyond the original objective of identifying immune responses and protection from disease. This was called the Childhood Rotavirus Infection Study, and it started at a time so long ago that GIS maps were a special thing. So to have a GIS map 20 years ago was really cool. Now we've got Google Maps and it doesn't matter quite as much. So we were able to do a study that showed us at what age children got infected, what age they developed disease. So if you just look at the six month time point, half of all children had already been infected by the time they reached six months of age, but only one fifth of them had actually had diarrhea because of rotavirus. We looked at specifically incidents, how many, when did children in each year of life get infection. And what we found was that in the first year, incidence was 1.2 rotavirus infections and uh, diarrhea was 0.5. So half of all children had a di rotavirus diarrhea in their first year of life. And then we also found that severe disease was actually quite common if you classified it on a score that is used to measure severity of rotavirus infection. We also found that not only was rotavirus the most common cause of diarrhea as we had expected, but it, was, it caused a much greater proportion of severe disease. So 15% of mild diarrheas, about 40% of moderate to severe diarrheas, but two thirds of all the very severe diarrheas. And about 2% of all the diarrheal episodes were hospitalized, but 4% of rotavirus diarrheal episodes were hospitalized, again, telling us that this was really severe disease. So what were our key findings from the natural history study? That 97% of children got infected, that children were infected early, disease happened early. Rotavirus reinfections in India, unlike the rest of the world, were symptomatic and rotavirus caused a great proportion of severe disease and mortality. We did the same thing in many other cohorts that we were using to study for other illnesses. There were three studies that we did in Velo and another study that was done in Delhi. And with these kinds of studies, what you wind up with is a range. So from 121 per thousand child years to 292 per thousand child years. So not a huge range, but giving us approximately what we should expect to see across the country. We looked not only at incidents in the community, we also looked at outpatient visits. And the point in using multiple data sources is to get that range so that you can have generalizable information. We also looked in hospitals. We worked with ICMR to develop the National Rotavirus Surveillance Network. And this does not have denominator data. It's not data that's coming from a population, but it tells us that among the severe disease that comes to hospital, 37% of all children that were hospitalized for diarrhea had rotavirus. We also joined a global network for rotavirus surveillance, and ours was the reference laboratory. So we went wider than India and now started to measure rotavirus burden in countries around the region. 
we were able to use all of these studies to come up with estimates of hospitalizations so that we could get a range of how many hospitalizations we thought were happening in the country. And this ranged from about 680,000 to about a million hospitalizations happening every year. We looked at the national surveys and across states and looked at how we could come up with estimates of how many children were dying. And this came to an estimate of between 95,000 and 160,000 children dying every year. We used all of this data to build what was a really comprehensive model of disease burden in India. And that told us, if you look to your left, that one in, if you follow children for a year, one in two will have a rotavirus infection. One in eight children will wind up in an outpatient clinic. One in 30 children will be hospitalized. And one in 650 children will die of a rotavirus gastroenteritis. So this was clearly far and away the biggest burden that you could think of having for any diarrheal pathogen. We also looked at economic costing. And I'll just point out that for the populations that we work with, one child being hospitalized for three days with the rotavirus gastroenteritis cost a family 120th of their annual income. This is out-of-pocket expenditure. We looked at how many families had to borrow money to be able to have their child in hospital. And you can see that as you get richer, your need to borrow money declines. But a large proportion of the households that we were sampling were borrowing money to pay for their child's illness. So disease burden, we presented to the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunizations. They were convinced that there was sufficient disease in India to introduce the vaccine. In other studies, we had been working on vaccine development and had shown that the vaccine worked, perhaps not as well as we had hoped, but worked nonetheless. And the vaccine was introduced in March and April of 2016, first in 9% of the birth cohort, but by December 2019, India-wide immunization was taking place. We also decided that for the first time, we would have an impact assessment in India. And for this, we used a hospital-based study design, which which is now familiar to the world as a test negative design being used everywhere to evaluate SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. But we started this for the first time in India with a test negative design. The phase one and two introducing states and all of the sites that we worked with are shown here. And our studies ultimately showed that the vaccine had 55% vaccine efficacy which is pretty good and was pretty much what we had seen in the efficacy trials. This effectiveness data was very similar to that. And that is very reassuring because this vaccine, Rotovac, is now WHO pre-qualified and is beginning to be used in countries around the world. Now, to measure impact, you do other things. You look to see does diarrheal admissions in hospitals decrease with time. What you can see in the dotted line is vaccine coverage going up. And what you can see in the dark blue line is the incidence or the detection of rotavirus positives in the community coming down. This is a very seasonal virus. You see it mostly in the winters. And you can see that after the vaccine was introduced, the orange line in the center that there has been a significant decline both in hospitalizations as well as in rotavirus case detections. Now, you, when you monitor impact and you measure, you don't measure just how well is the vaccine working. You also measure whether it is safe or not. 
And for rotavirus, this was particularly important because the first rotavirus vaccine, which was licensed, was withdrawn because it had a side effect called intersusception, where the one part of the gut telescopes into another. And this usually happens in the first week after the first dose of the vaccine, as shown in the graph right on top. Now, we did safety monitoring, and you can see that you don't really see a clustering after dose one, dose two, or dose three of the vaccine. There are cases of intersusception, but they are spread out in the time post-vaccination. So it may be that where the vaccine works less, less well, you also have fewer safety events. And this is important for public health programs to know. This is just calculating the relative risk of intersusception in each risk period, showing that there was no detected risk. Now, moving from that, rotavirus, which could be detected by an ELISA and typed by PCR, we moved to measuring typhoid. Now, everybody knows typhoid. You get it from contaminated food and water. It's common in public perception. There are even lots of people that want to be able to treat it, right? We export typhoid to other parts of the world. But when it came to the medical community, if you look down here at this report from the Times of India, uh, doctors didn't think typhoid was necessary. That's because they were sitting in hospitals and typhoid can be treated with antibiotics. So anybody who had a suspicion of typhoid went to a clinic, went to a pharmacy, got antibiotics. The antibiotics worked well and magic, no typhoid in the country. And we thought that this picture was wrong and decided that we wanted to measure the burden of typhoid in India. And to do that was challenging because the only way you can do typhoid diagnosis is by doing a blood culture. And blood culture is not very sensitive. So we built essentially a multi-tiered, multi-site surveillance program to try and measure everything we could measure about typhoid. The idea was to get the incidence of typhoid fever in the target community, which is young children, to measure severe typhoid fever, to look at antimicrobial use, to be able to estimate healthcare costs. I think you can see where I'm going here. We made this work for rotavirus. Could we make it work again for typhoid? Because again, this is a vaccine that allows for more equity? I think there's a question. Yeah, so does it? Hello, Professor Kong. Hi. So does it make sense to have these kind of, you know, massive cohorts, 27 lakh people and uh, sequential kind of analysis for rotavirus and then for typhoid, or does it make sense to do it together? What are the issues? Absolutely makes sense to do it together. And we'll come to that in my conclusions. It's a complete and utter waste of effort to keep repeating this again and again. But what choice do we have? So anyway, we set up massive cohorts, 6,000 children in four sites. And we followed them um, every week to identify children who had fever, did automated blood cultures, and then measured the hell out of these communities. What did we find? We found 249 cases of blood culture confirmed typhoid. And this gave us in our urban sites of Delhi, Kolkata, and Vellore an incidence between 500 and almost 1,200 per 100,000 child years. Now, remember that WHO classifies very high incidence of typhoid as over 200 per 100,000 child years. So we've got a lot there. The urban sites had a lot. The rural site in Pune had a lot less. And we also did studies in more remote parts of the country, in Manali, in Assam, in uh, Maharashtra, in uh, Chinchpada, in rural Andhra Pradesh, etc. And here we used a facility and looked to see who came to the facility 
and what they found there. So we had to have a catchment area for each of the hospitals that we were working with. We essentially took everybody who came into the hospital, tried to do a blood culture on them, and then looked in the community to see what proportion of the community came to that facility for their fevers, a healthcare utilization survey. And when we looked at incidence of typhoid at tier two sites, what we found was that we had the highest rates in Chandigarh, which was an urban site. And all of the rural sites had high rates, but not nearly as high as what we were seeing in urban areas. Now, this makes sense, but there hadn't been a measurement ever before at this level. We also looked at large hospitals around the country to try and identify what were the antimicrobial resistance patterns and what complications were occurring. We found that there were a lot of ileal perforations and surgeons used to operate on ileal perforations a lot before antibiotics, but they are still occurring in today's day and age was a surprise to us. We looked at resistance patterns, and this was important because right next to us in Pakistan, we have an extensively drug-resistant salmonella typhi. And it was previously thought that there was a clade of S typhi called H58, which is resistant to other antibiotics, which had spread from India to Africa in the late 1980s. And the Pakistani H58 has both plasmid and chromosomally mediated resistance genes. So the worry is how much will this be able to spread? We were able to do whole genome analysis on 2,500 STIP isolates. And we, were, we showed through that that H58 had emerged earlier than was previously known. And that reassuringly, at the moment, we don't have the XDR strain that is circulating in Pakistan, but we do have strains that are resistant to the only two antibiotics that can be given orally. So we don't need for these to spread. We also did modeling studies to look at vaccination strategies, trying to figure out what kind of vaccination program should we do all children? Should we add in urban areas only? Should we do campaigns or not to come in to try and predict what the impact would be? So where are we today? Well, we've presented the status quo, the routine urban plus campaign, routine all plus campaign, and demonstrated to the government that if we do routine plus campaign, we can shorten at least three to four years of the potential impact of typhoid vaccination. This data has been presented to the NTAGI. The full committee meets on June 28th, so my fingers are crossed. We have supply in India. India is the only country making typhoid conjugate vaccines, and two of these are WHO pre-qualified. So if you wish me well, hope for a positive decision on June 28th, but doesn't matter so much for me as it does matter for particularly children who live in slums in India. Now I'd like to come to the final bit, which is SARS-CoV-2 burden, mortality, and questions. So if you look at The Economist, The Economist estimates that there have been 26 million deaths and the official figures are 6.3 million deaths. So if you look at the excess deaths per 100,000 people, that's what's shown on the right. And on the left there, you have the official figures. Now you can also see by looking at these two graphs that some countries change more than others, right? In some countries, they, the official and the estimated excess deaths match up. In our country, they don't. Now I'd like to also look, like you to look at these columns and draw your own conclusions from this. 
This is Maharashtra right on top, a population of 125 million, zero positivity of 58% in June of 2021, before vaccination was very widespread. The maximum number of deaths in the country, the maximum number of cases in the country. Let's compare that to Uttar Pradesh, which has almost doubled the population, a higher zero positivity rate and one-sixth the deaths, one-third, less than one-third the cases. Do you believe these measurements? So there is a disconnect of what is above and below the water, and I'm treating the water below the water as zero positivity, which tells you infections, and what's above the water is what is actually being measured. And of course, we have no real evaluation of the interventions, which are vaccines. So what do we need to move forward? One, we need to prepare surveillance systems for detection and rapid genomic characterization of new variants. We don't need random testing. We don't need case counts anymore. We need systematic surveillance of respiratory illness, not SARS-CoV-2, respiratory illnesses and of clusters of illnesses. We need to evaluate the performance of vaccines. What we are working with today is first generation vaccines. There will be a second generation. How will we know which ones we should use and when? I think we need to seriously strengthen our public health abilities to measure and to do surveillance. And we need new tools. Those new tools are both for intervention as well as for surveillance. There are essential public health services. They require assessment. They require assurance. None of this happens if we cannot measure what we want to measure. Assuring access to people really requires measurement. Measurement matters for making policy and for evaluating impact. Building siloed surveillance is wasteful. It is bad practice. It is bad use of resources. But it's been essential so far to actually drive any kind of priority settings. And if we know anything, we know that if we measure impact, it can reveal lacunae in performance. And this can allow us to look at further investigations and potentially new in interventions. Look at the Human Development Index. There, we have a lot to be proud of in everything that we have done, but we also have a really long way to go. Thank you very much for the invitation and for your attention. So the talk is open for questions. If there are any questions, please raise your hands and there are people who are going around with them. Thank you for the talk. I actually had um, two questions. So the first one is you mentioned that there were major urban rural differences in the prevalence of uh, typhoid. Are there also a lot of geographical variations uh, for rotavirus? No, rotavirus is a much more democratic virus. The, it's just a question of timing. So rotavirus infects Americans, the Finns, people in Botswana, people in India. It's just a question of, is it during the first year of life or the second year of life? Typhoid that way is a much more heterogeneous disease, much harder to measure because it's so variable in terms of the populations and over time. You have questions? Yeah. I was curious about your rotavirus data that there was only a subset of people, a subset of children who fell ill. Is that because there was maternal transference of immunity? And do adults get rotavirus, even though it seems that most of your studies have been done with young people? Okay, adults get rotavirus. So 
you get immunity to rotavirus over time because you have multiple exposures, but a high infectious dose can break through that immunity. And we know this because mothers in particular of children who have rotavirus diarrhea develop rotavirus gastroenteritis. So that's your second question. And the first one was about variability in vaccine performance. The first one was why is that a smaller, you know, it was not the entire cohort of infections who got the disease. Was that due to maternal inheritance of uh, protection? Okay. So there are lots of other studies. Surprisingly, Indian women in their serum have high antibodies to rotavirus, but very low antibodies in their breast milk. And we don't understand why. And we have looked at not so much the you know, protection from infection, where breastfeeding does not seem to protect from infection in Indian children. But we've looked at vaccine response and the impact of maternal serum and maternal uh, breast milk antibodies on vaccine response in the child and shown that maternal antibodies explain about 10% of the variability in the child's vaccine response. So there's a growing evidence showing that climate change will have an impact on the prevalence of vector-borne disease. So what do you expect will happen for waterborne disease in terms of trends? Well, flooding events are increasing in any case. And many of the diseases that we deal with, enteric infectious diseases, are more common in areas where there is flooding. When you have a mixture of poor sanitation and flooding, that kind of creates the perfect storm for an increase in enteric infectious diseases. So essentially, watch this space. This one question. Yeah, actually, I've been uh, wanting to ask this question for a long time, and I do not know whether this is the right platform to ask this, but uh, this is regarding uh, the side effects or the fatal effects of the COVID shield uh, vaccine. So because uh, the vaccine was introduced in a hurry due to the large scale of infections and the safety uh, factor was had to be ignored. So uh, there Nobody are... Nobody ignores safety. Yeah, so actually why I'm asking you this is that I there is a family whom I know very closely and uh, their son uh, who after reaching 18 years of age uh, last August, just after two, three days, he took uh, the COVID shield vaccine. And uh, I think he got a very, one of the worst uh, reactions to that. And uh, he suffered from hemorrhage. He got something which uh, I think it's called VITT, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And uh, today, because of this, uh, he is paralyzed totally. He can't walk on his own and he can't speak. His speech is impaired. And he was in the Apollo Hospital, New Bombay, for four months in ICU. His parents spent about 50 lakhs for his treatment. Yeah. So I know this case because it was so close to me. And I have heard that uh, there are a few cases like that, cases fatal like cases that. like that. Yes. So I just want to know that the policy makers and the vaccine makers, what, what do they have to say to these people? So I showed you interception right? Why we were monitoring intersusception in children, because intersusception is the commonest surgical emergency in children. And if it is untreated, children die. Rotavirus vaccines in other parts of the world, we haven't, in India, we did not find the risk. But in other parts of the world, rotavirus vaccines are very clearly associated with a low risk of intersusception. It varies between one in 20,000 and one in 100,000 vaccinated infants that can develop intersusception. There is no vaccine that is 100% safe. There is no drug that is 100% safe. 
with COVID shield, vaccine induced thrombocytopenic, uh, sorry, BITT is a known complication. Initially, it was believed to be something that was occurring in as low as one in 4,000 vaccinated individuals. More recently, I don't look at Indian data because I think in India, many of the cases that we have of BITT have not been recorded. I am very sure that from what you are describing that this really was VITT, but it is a rare event. It's now estimated to be one in 60,000 to one in 200,000 vaccinated individuals might develop VITT. The other thing to remember is that for VITT in Australia, the mortality rate is 3% because they recognize it early and they treat it early. The treatment is a treatment that is available in India. It is intravenous immunoglobulin. It can be given if the disease is recognized early enough. Our problem is we don't communicate risk effectively. We don't recognize side effects when they occur. And that results in the kind of tragedy that you're describing. So is, is, can we report this to uh, the government? It means how, how do we go about it? There's how do supposed we... to be a program, you know, the COVID app and Arogya Setu are supposed to have the ability to record information. I know from a number of people that it has been an issue that they have been unable to report to the authorities. There is a national AEFI committee that reviews these cases. Unfortunately, many of the reports for one reason or the other don't seem to reach them. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, so I'm really talk. sorry, but yeah. it'll it's have a, to be the last question. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, but it's a very simple question. It's not a question, actually, I want your opinion, because you mentioned in the, uh, your talk about the vital test and the blood culture for diagnosis of uh, typhoid. But still in India, you find a small laboratories, they do this test. So what what do you think about this? How the do, what test the is rubbish. And, yeah. So but still people are carrying out these tests. So it's what, still what is rubbish. <laughs> and what so, a blood culture. <laughs> well, so, the only good test we have, and this is not for people's lack of trying. Everybody yeah. is desperate to get a better typhoid test. Yes. But in a place that is endemic, you cannot use the Vidal test. And unfortunately, because it's an easy test yes. to do, lots of people continue to do it. That doesn't make the test any better. You could toss a coin and get the same result. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we'll have to call it a day there because uh, she has a flight to catch. And uh, knowing the Mumbai traffic, we don't want her to miss the flight. Um, I mean, she landed from Netherlands midnight last night, and so I think she needs some rest. So, with that, uh, I'll thank uh, Gagandeep Kang for a wonderful talk, and for all of you for participating. Thank you.